Hi, my name's Ed, and I really like Half-Life 2. In fact, it was the cultural touchstone for most of my friendships while I was a kid. Mr. Freeman. Honestly, my life's been going downhill from there. In fact, a lot of my friends seem to feel the same way. Despairing about story-driven first-person shooters. It feels like Half-Life 2 set a particularly high watermark for games combining carefully designed action-adventure gameplay and a rich, textured game world. World building in games, much like its filmic bigger sister setting, is a deep, cavernous line of inquiry. And I'm really not qualified to mine that particular seam. What I am qualified to do, however, is examine exactly how politics and world building can interlace. So welcome to this video essay on Half-Life, Alien Life, and the history of the late, great Soviet Union. No, 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 stop. No, no, no. Half-Life 2 is a cult classic video game released in 2004 by Valve Software. It's a first-person shooter game combining puzzles, exploration, and shooting at really existing aliens. You play as Gordon Freeman, a really existing scientist who, at the end of the previous game, triggered a seismic event that allowed aliens to travel through a portal to Earth, a situation that a particular alien race called the Combine took advantage of in order to, in effect, cuck the human race and fill their world with really existing aliens. In the alternate history of Half-Life 2, the Combine landed on Earth as the aforementioned portal opened and fought humanity in what was called the Seven Hour War. The war was won by the aliens in the space of, you guessed it, seven hours, and they implemented a device called the Suppression Field, creating a children of men kind of situation where the human population is slowly dying out, as new children cannot be born. Against this backdrop of decay, the player awakes on a train trundling into City 17, centre of the Combine occupation, and one of the most iconic locations in modern gaming history. City 17 was designed by Viktor Antonov, who would go on to design the world of Dishonored and consult on a multitude of other big games. But unlike Dishonored, which arguably has a fantasy setting, Half-Life 2's world is a reflection of our own. City 17 is ostensibly an Eastern European city, built of imposing apartment blocks and wide public squares. It has a large railway station reminiscent of the age of the Grand Tour, and a town hall that wouldn't look out of place in Belgrade, because it was probably based on the one in Belgrade. But the really interesting thing about City 17 is how it's been colonised. The structures that the Combine have built on top of the old European flavours give the place a distinctly uncanny edge. It's recognisable, but not quite. It belongs to our time, our space, but it's also influenced by a separate other that we don't know nor control. The way the Combine have marked their territory makes City 17 a place that unnerves the player. From the off, something is not quite right. And that feeling grows as the player builds an understanding of the world the Combine has left behind. Swings are empty. Suppression field. No kids. Roundabout is empty. Suppression field. No kids. All the vending machines are advertising this fucking smart water. The canals are in algal bloom, drained metres below the waterline, as the Combine slowly sucks the resources from the dying planet. The tenements in which the remnants of human society live are dilapidated, emptied, free of possessions, attachments, personalities, all those bubbles of brilliance that float to the top of society have been skimmed off. There is an underground railroad for those bold enough to try and escape City 17, people living on dirty mattresses in shipping containers, or on old sewer outflows in the drained canals. There is graffiti everywhere. The world is desolate, quiet, Hardly busy, and yet it feels so alive, stacked with the spectre of an Eastern Europe that probably existed once. In this respect, the world of Half-Life 2 can feel like a new totalitarianism, haunted by an old one. Oh, uh, also, the world has really existing aliens. The first time the player is introduced to a hostile headcrab is via aerial bombardment. The Combine are dropping these missiles like some kind of insurrection deterrent for those who stray too far from the city. 
These head crabs make for disconcerting enemies, and they're small enough to hide between the cracks. These little boys jump on the heads of the unwary and turn them to human husks. Surrogates for the crab. Okay, th fine, they're zombies, okay? Then there's the ant lions. I didn't realise until the other day when I was making this video that their eyes are actually up here. And that there's only one eye and it's massive and the front legs are behind the back legs and oh, it'd be so easy to say this is just an ant lion. But it's more than that. It sounds like a cursed grasshopper and flies like a homing pigeon. Ant lions are the last thing you'd want to find under your bed after maybe this bad boy. And then there's the combine enemies themselves, the aliens who won the war against humanity and took control of human society. They're designed, like many elements of the game, to evoke the uncanny, though we never see them directly besides this one advisor. Instead, the combine construct enemies called synths, dropships, gunships, and striders that mix organic and mechanical forms together. The official story is that these are other alien races modified by the Combine to fight, and it looks like the Combine have been doing this to human life as well. Ah, the boots on the ground, the bread and butter of the army that maintains the new world order. They're augmented humans who wear face masks. No, not the Rona kind, the World War II kind, I guess. These face masks disguise their augmentations. It's implied that the Force are given these masks so that they may be stationed off-planet if necessary to other worlds that might be otherwise uninhabitable to human life. In any case, the soldiers come in three tiers, and it's civil protection who are arguably the most uncanny. There's <laughs> no colour in their eyes. Civil protection are generally unmodified humans who sign up for a cushier lifestyle. This is the only tier exempt from the Combine's habit of memory replacement, i.e. wiping your memories, which makes civil protection prone to rebel insurrection. About that beer I owed you. But outside of the rebel elements, this sect is made up of the humans who have willingly decided that they wish to side with the invaders, the sorts of people who would rank highly on Adorno's F scale. F is for fascist. Civil protection are a gruelling reminder that under totalitarianism, some individuals are bound to be more opportunist than others. Civil protection are the Combine's answer to the Red Guard, the militias of communist China formed from indoctrination and fear. Civil protection are modelled on previous human practice, and their willingness to dole out a stumbaton is more disconcerting as a result. You know what, just as an aside, I think one of the reasons why I sympathise so much with the world of Half-Life 2 is because of where I grew up. Around here, East Anglia is a lot like Eastern Europe. The Great European Plain starts here and goes all the way to Moscow. The heaths of East Anglia are shaped by the squall from Siberia. And the abandoned infrastructure, symptomatic of capital flows further south, is powerfully evocative of the bleak imagined scenes from some Soviet city. These canal locks especially put me in the mind of similar scenes from Half-Life 2 if I go out for a wintry walk and put the soundtrack on. The music in Half-Life 2 is gorgeous and gently disorienting. It's a mixture of garagey 90s instrumentation and synth like the really existing Alien layered on top of the music you'd expect Naughty's game designers to listen to. The synths sound like something cyber squelchy, like they're being played through a mixture of brake fluid and amniotic fluid. It's organic, but not quite all organic. It's someone else's. The meter of the synths seems to match that of a police siren or an alarm, reminding us of how the Combine behave as enemies in the game, all equipped with walkie-talkies that blare out as soon as they keel over. Just as soon as we might be able to make contact with the other side, it dials out on us. Nice. So, look, at this point, you're probably wondering, 
Why do I insist on calling the aliens in Half-Life really existing aliens? What's the difference between really existing aliens and regular old aliens? I thought you'd be in Georgia by now getting probed. Well, the world of Half-Life 2 has aliens mixed in an uncanny breakfast blend with human society. These aren't aliens on some other planet, space station, or intergalactic UN. I'm Garrus Vakarian, and this is now my favourite spot on the Citadel. No, these aliens affect human society directly. They aren't theoretical, absent, or elsewhere. They're present. They're applied. This is your this brain, is your brain on, on aliens. A lot of sci-fi storytelling focuses in on alien invasion, like War of the Worlds or Day of the Triffids, neglecting what the world looks like after the aliens have invaded. Half-Life 2, in fairness, isn't the only story set on an Earth conquered by aliens, but I think it captures the mood best, the nerve of a society where the aliens have already won and really existing aliens are very much present. Now, you might also want to know where the phrase really existing X, Y or Z came from. Well, it's a term that was invented by Leonid Brezhnev, former leader of the Soviet Union, to apply to socialism, really existing socialism, claiming that the perhaps utopian standards of Marxist-Leninist thought could not necessarily be held up to the imperfect conditions of the time in the USSR. It was in the midst of the Cold War, Stalin had been a bit of a mixed bag, you know, what with the mass famine and that. The Iron Curtain was just being pulled too when Brezhnev was speaking. So really existing socialism gave him an excuse to explain why socialism wasn't looking so hot right there and then compared to Marx's dream of hunting in the morning, fishing in the afternoon, raising cattle in the evening and philosophising after dinner. The implication was that socialism existed one way theoretically, but that it existed differently in practice. Brezhnev could use this logic to defend the USSR, but the political right could also use it to prove that the only worked example of socialism was a bit of a basket case. In the same way, the political left could raise concerns over whether there was really such a thing as really existing capitalism, without any kind of interference on the free trade of goods because most market economies, to this day, feature at least a degree of state interference, tariffs on goods, or public provision of a service like the police. I mean, civil protection. The world of Half-Life 2 clearly evokes a post-Soviet space, from the Eastern architectures to the Cyrillic text. But instead of replacing the really existing socialism that died in 1989 with a mixed market economy, it's been replaced by really existing aliens. Civil protection, suppression field, bloody smart water. Don't drink the water. They put something in it to, to make you forget. These are not just aliens jumping out of spaceships and dancing around with ray guns, like Marx and his bloody fishing trip. Why? These are aliens implemented in a context like Brezhnev and his sad sack collapsing country. As a result, Half-Life 2 trades in the uncanny. The recognised signs mixed up with something weird and eerie. Alien mask on human face. Alien crab on human head. Alien train on human rail. Alien advisor on human technocrat. From the music to the architecture to civil bloody protection, even an omnipotent alien race has to follow in the footsteps of old humanity. To establish something that can function like a human society, the Combine colony has to have some kind of benchmark. The Soviet space that City 17 is post. When any force for change, be it a protest movement, a political party, or an alien empire, goes to enact that change, they don't just bulldoze the status quo. Maintaining a modicum of the old ways creates buy-in and understanding for the new ones. Remember him from Black Mesa? Your old administrator. Maybe Brezhnev's claim about really existing socialism rang so hollow because people knew it was impossible to create a platonic ideal of orthodox Marxism in real life. It would have to reflect the society it was built on top of. In other words, ideology doesn't exist in a vacuum. It projects itself onto society. When the Labour Party placed the cornerstone of the NHS in 1948, setting the new global standard for healthcare that was free at the point of use, they made sure that it was carefully implemented. Public service broadcasts were delivered nationwide, urging people to choose their doctor. 
the medical professional they'd kept prior to the NHS would continue to serve them, but under a new system, one that was run in the public interest. At the time, state ownership was new, novel, indeed radical, but the good old doctors provided a constant, even as hospitals were refurbished and procedures were advanced. In short, the foundations of the new are best built in the bedrock of the old. I love Half-Life 2. I think it's one of the most atmospheric video games ever created. It's tonally consistent, aesthetically interesting, and powerfully uncanny. But if there's one political message to pull out of this game, it's that the most evocative, effective change is change that shows us where we're going without ignoring where we are now.